I'm the girl who talks a lot. I'm the girl who always has her head in the clouds. I'm the girl that tries to find the humor in every situation. I'm the girl who's too much. Hi, I'm Sam Richardson, and this is my podcast, Living Richardson. I hope you're enjoying getting to know my backstory. Continuing with my dramatic past, in today's episode, you will learn all about the girl who made me a mother, Cadence Michelle. Before we dive in, I would like to issue a trigger warning that this story is about infant loss. I vividly remember that night, 14 years ago. Holy shit, that's a long time. The night that I watched those infamous two pink lines materialize, indicating a positive pregnancy. I was 18 years old and scared shitless. In three months, I was supposed to leave for the American Musical and Dramatic Academy in New York City. But now, my entire future was being completely redirected. I had also just started seeing Tim, and we had yet to consummate the relationship, meaning I was pregnant with my ex-boyfriend's baby. That was something I always felt ashamed of, but really, what for? Yes, I would have chosen different circumstances surrounding how I became a mom, but that's simply not the case. Life doesn't often go as we plan, as society says we should plan. And that's okay. Because overall, it's not the circumstances that surround us that is of the utmost importance. It's how we manage our lives once these circumstances have presented themselves. The beginning of my pregnancy was normal as could be. So I was in complete shock when, at my 20-week ultrasound appointment, my doctor noticed something wasn't quite right with the baby's heart. She referred me to a specialist, and I was told my baby was going to be born with a congenital heart defect known as pulmonary atresia. Pulmonary atresia is a birth defect of the pulmonary valve, which is the valve that controls blood flow from the right ventricle to the main pulmonary artery. Pulmonary atresia is when this valve doesn't form at all and no blood can go from the right ventricle of the heart out to the lungs. About one in every 7,100 babies born in the United States each year are born with this congenital heart defect. The doctors informed me that once the baby was born, she would immediately be placed on a ventilator and transported to the local children's hospital and admitted to the NICU while she awaited surgery. She would undergo her first open heart surgery to place a stint at only a few weeks old, then again between the age of six to eight months old, and again around the age of four. Other than seeing specialists and having multiple echocardiograms performed, my pregnancy remained pretty normal. On February 2nd, 2009, when I was 38 weeks pregnant, I had my normal weekly checkup. When the doctors checked me, I was dilated to one centimeter and I was having mild contractions. So they decided to admit me for monitoring since I was considered high risk with the baby's condition. Through the night and into the morning, my contractions became stronger and it was clear that labor was starting. However, I never dilated more than one centimeter. We later found this out to be that I have a tilted uterus and apparently I will never be able to have a natural birth. As my contractions intensified, the baby's heart rate decreased with each one, which was obviously concerning. So I was taken to the OR for an emergency C-section. On February 3rd, 2009, at 1.33 p.m., Cadence Michelle Shamrock was born. And as cliche as this is, my life was never the same again. I had the opportunity to hear her cry for a few seconds, but... They whisked her to an adjoining room to insert her breathing tube before I had the chance to see her. After I was stitched up, I was moved to a recovery room where they would allow me to briefly see Cadence before they transported her a mile down the road to the children's hospital. I will never forget the first time I saw my daughter. Five individuals dressed in jumpsuits that read transport team slowly and steadily wheeled an incubator into my room. There was a small door, if you will, on the side that opened, and I was able to slip my hand through and touch her. I was only allowed to be with her for a few seconds. 
And I'm not even exaggerating on that. She was in my room for less than a minute before they had to move her. She was all I could think about as I laid alone in the hospital room that night, unable to sleep. The life I had carried for nine months was finally here, but she wasn't with me. Originally, I was told I wouldn't be able to visit her for a few days since I had a C-section, but on the day following her birth, my doctor allowed me to leave my hospital to visit her for an hour. As I was wheeled through the NICU room, I thought my heart would stop. Six babies lay in incubators, fighting to live. And in the first one rest my little warrior. I slipped my hand through the opening again, and as if on cue, her eyes fluttered open, and my daughter and I looked at each other for the first time. Even though I was told she wouldn't have her first surgery until she was a few weeks old, Cadence was stronger than doctors anticipated, and she underwent her first open-heart surgery when she was three days old. Six hours feels like a lifetime when you know there are literally hands inside your newborn's chest working to keep her alive. The surgery was a success, but as the days following came and went, Cadence didn't improve. The doctors had anticipated her being well enough to come home on day five, but when she still wasn't better, they performed a heart cath where they insert a catheter through the vein in her groin and up to her heart. It showed that there were more complications than we had thought with her heart. In fact, her condition was so rare, they asked me to sign documents allowing her story to be in medical journals. The doctors came up with a plan and they booked a new surgery for her two days later. But the day before the surgery, Cadence spiked a fever and they could not operate. At two weeks old, Cadence was bouncing back and forth with a fever. Then came the first time I thought we would lose her. We were alarmed with the threat of sepsis, a severe blood poisoning that can shut down the entire body. We were told to contact our family and invite them to the hospital for what was thought to be her final night. My grandmother, you know the one, sat by Cadence's bedside holding her hand all night. I genuinely think this is what led her to survive the night and awake fever and sepsis free. She had such the little personality. She had learned the doctor's voices, and when she heard them, she'd pout her lip and let out what would be the loudest scream of all if it weren't for the ventilator. She would become so content lying in only her diaper, getting her tan under the heat lamp, that if you even so much as thought to touch her, you'd awink at the cranky beast inside. We'd wash her with a washcloth, and if you accidentally tugged her hair, She'd pout that lip, crinkle that forehead, and you knew you were in trouble. It was so hard to believe that this baby that looked so healthy could be so sick. When Cadence was a month old, there was still no progress. And after being so sick from the sepsis, they figured the only thing they could do to save her was to get her a new heart. In order to receive a new heart, she would have to be transported to the Cleveland Clinic but transporting her would be a risk. Because she was so sick, the ride could be fatal. I was given every mother's worst nightmare. Do I proceed with the transport, or do I let them slowly stop the medications and let her go peacefully? During my pregnancy, when I learned that she was going to be sick, I promised myself and her that this was a fight I would not back down from. I would not stop until all of our options had been exhausted. So, the next morning, I put my sweet newborn on the Air Bear, the children's hospital helicopter, and off she went to Cleveland. Usually, one parent rides with a child, but Cadence was on so many different medications, her pumps for all of them took my seat. To everyone's surprise, Cadence made it, but she did suffer a stroke during the flight. Unfortunately, we wouldn't know the severity until she was older and would become more mobile. When I arrived at the hospital half an hour after her, the doctors were suited up and waiting for me. They had a new plan of action, but they needed my signature until they can take her back for surgery. They believed an angioplasty would open the blocked vessels, which is what they believed was the issue. Once I signed the paper, they immediately took her to surgery, and it was a smashing success. Finally, there seemed to be a light at the end of this tunnel. Until the next day, when she cardiac arrested in front of me. Cadence was so sick that there was one nurse specifically assigned to be in her room 24-7. 
I was sitting on a chair in her room reading, when suddenly Cadence's heart rate quickly began dropping. The nurse threw her head in the hall and yelled, We need a crash cart! I jumped up with panic. Doctors and nurses flooded in and I screamed. The only thing I could do. One nurse took me by the shoulders and pulled me into the hall as I fell to my knees. Other parents entered the hall and comforted me as we watched the nurse through the glass window perform CPR for three minutes. Then a miracle. Cadence came to and things went back to normal, as if nothing had happened. Cadence went into cardiac arrest twice again after this incident, and each time they were able to bring her back. It was as if she were meant to be here. A week later, they were ready to place another shunt, the first step on getting her home. It was another five-hour surgery. When it was over, they told us that she would be sleepy from all of the medication, so that she wouldn't be alert. But by then, we knew to expect anything but the norm from Cadence. With the first word I spoke, her eyes flew open, and she looked at me as if to say, Hey mom, look at me. I've got a new shunt. I get to come home soon. Cadence had a fabulous next few days. Vitals were looking good. She was pushing a lot of the fluid off, and she even started to gain mobility in the right side of her body that she had lost after the stroke. I couldn't believe a six-week-old baby could be such a fighter. Then came the worst day of my life, March 20th, 2009. I could sense something was wrong when I entered Cadence's room that morning. The nurses told me her vitals were done and that the doctor wanted to talk to me. Waiting for the doctor, I decided to give Cadence a sponge bath. The nurse left the room for us to enjoy our mother-daughter time which gave me red flag signals because for six weeks, the nurse never left the room. But I began bathing her. If I was given the opportunity to relive any five minutes for my entire life over again, this would be it. As I bathed her, I sang to her. She focused on me so intently. It was like she knew this would be our last moments together. I sang to her until she fell asleep. As soon as I was done bathing her, my mom and grandma came in, followed by the doctor. As if on cue, Cadence's heart rate declined again, like the three previous times it did when she went into cardiac arrest. I jumped up and looked at the doctor and nurse, waiting for them to spring into action. But they didn't move. They just stood there watching the monitor. I remember yelling, aren't you going to do something? The doctor turned to me, and I knew what I was about to hear. It seems as though Cadence has sepsis again. She is on the highest volumes of medication. There is nothing more we can do for her. This time, she will not pull through. It's time to say goodbye. I collapsed into a chair and buried my head in my hands. My brain would not wrap itself on what I had just heard. I thought it was a dream. But it wasn't. The fight was really over. All the blood rushed from my body. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. The baby I had grown and loved was leaving me. My family came again, and all we could do was sit and watch as she slowly faded. The nurses let me hold her as she passed. They informed me that approximately 15 minutes after she was placed in my arms, she would probably go. Much to everyone's surprise, an hour later she was still breathing. I decided to let my family get the chance to hold her as well. All 11 people got to hold her, and about 10 minutes into the last person's turn, she started fading faster. She was placed back in my arms, and five minutes later, the doctor checked her heart, and she was gone. At 3.15 a.m. on March 21st, 2009, the nurses removed all of her tubes, which is the first time I ever saw my baby girl without them, and they wrapped her in a blanket. I held her until I couldn't see anymore. I couldn't bear to put her down. This little person that I had witnessed fight for her entire life through several surgeries and cardiac arrests was never going to open her eyes again. And that's all I wanted. 
was to see her eyes one more time. When it was time for me to go, I kissed her soft skin and handed her to the nurses. With the support of my family and their arms locked around me, I found the courage to hold my head up and walk down the hospital hall one last time. To this day, I can still smell the sterile stench of antiseptic. I went home the next day after not being there for six weeks. This was my home, but now it felt like a stranger's. Cards and flowers ran through my house, and I cried with every single one. The funeral parlor let me dress Cadence and fix her hair, since I never had the chance to do it while she was alive. She was so beautiful. I held it together decently through calling hours, and then it was time to go. That's when I lost it. It would be the last time I would ever see my baby, and I wasn't ready to give her up. My grandfather and Tim had to pull me away and walk me to the car. The next morning was her funeral. My mom and I carried her casket. It was so tiny. At the burial, when the service was over, I threw myself onto her casket and screamed when they pulled me away. Go ahead, call me dramatic now. As the days went on, Everyone surrounding me went back to their lives, while I didn't move from my couch. I honestly did not do anything but watch movies, clutching a stuffed animal that had been Cadence's for a month following her death. Then one day, I realized I was only 19 years old, with a lot of years ahead of me. It was time to make the decision to either pick up and keep going, or allow myself to be swallowed up by this tragedy and never crawl out of this deep hole of depression. I knew I owed it to Cadence to keep living, to find happiness and honor her memory. So I got up and started down the path that would lead me to where I am today. I don't tell this story to receive pity. Honestly, I've grown numb to pity, numb to the somber expressions that consumes people's faces when I tell them about her. I tell her story to remember her, to remember her fight. That is something I will always carry with me. I tell her story to bring awareness to congenital heart defects. I was fortunate that the doctors caught the defect while I was pregnant, so we were prepared when she was born. Congenital heart defects often go undetected prior to birth, and many babies pass within a few days because treatment was started too late. I was fortunate to have had six weeks with my daughter when so many other parents don't. And I tell her story to help parents who are going through or have gone through a similar situation. I was a NICU and PICU mom. I know how it feels to stand idle, feeling helpless, while you watch your child fight for their life. You are not alone. You are not alone when you're actively living that trauma, and you're not alone years later when the trauma sneaks back in and hits you on your darkest days. I know, Mama. I know how deep it hurts. When you go through something like this, everybody constantly says how strong you are. And that makes me feel like a fraud. Because I don't feel like I'm strong. What other options do we have than to move forward or stop? It's been 13 years since I lost Cadence. And I am not over it. I still cry when I think about her. It's almost like this experience didn't even happen to me. I think I have an issue dissociating through trauma. And I guess that's for my mental health episode. But over time, your life adjusts to the trauma you experienced. And it no longer is something that happened to you. It becomes something that is part of who you are now and part of your story. Often people will feel bad for asking me about Cadence, thinking it hurts, but it doesn't at all. I love talking about her. I love remembering her. I knew one day I would have kids again, and I was always worried that they would feel a disconnect from her, but I tell them about her, and they miss her just as much as I do. We really don't give our children enough credit, you guys. 
They understand so much more than we think they do. I also wanted to speak about the miscarriage I experienced. I mentioned in an earlier episode that I had a miscarriage that was called a blighted ovum, and I received a lovely email from a woman named Emily regarding that. Emily wrote that plenty of women talk about miscarriages and pregnancy loss, but few talk about the specifics, much less blighted ovums. I gasped when you actually used the words because I don't think I ever heard anyone else do so outside of a clinical setting. First of all, Emily, thank you so much for reaching out. I am so glad that I was able to help you feel less alone with what you also experienced. A blighted ovum is a pregnancy in which the embryo never develops or develops and is reabsorbed. In a normal pregnancy, an embryo would be visible on an ultrasound by six weeks. A blighted ovum is characterized by a normal appearing gestational sac, but the absence of an embryo. In 2017, I took a home pregnancy test and it was positive. When I went in for my eight week ultrasound, I looked at the screen and my heart dropped. I mean, this was my fourth pregnancy. I knew what I should be looking at on the screen. And what I saw was an empty sack, except for some like little things floating around, to which the doctor told me, you have what I believe is a blighted ovum, meaning you are pregnant, but the embryo is not forming. And you can see here, there's a lot of debris floating around. I was pregnant, excited to have a new baby. And the doctor just looked at my uterus and said, there's only some debris floating around. Right bedside manner, right? They told me to come back in two weeks and we would see if there was any changes that maybe possibly I was not as far as long as we thought, but she said it was very doubtful. Those two weeks were absolutely agonizing because I had all the symptoms of pregnancy but had no clue if the baby was actually there. Two weeks later, when we went back in, sure enough, the sack was still empty, except for the lovely debris floating around. And they gave me an option. They said, we can either take you in for a DNC or you can let your body naturally pass it. And so I decided to try to let it naturally pass. But when I was about 12 weeks pregnant, my body was still acting like there was a baby. So I had no choice other than to have a DNC because my body was gonna just keep going along with the idea that I actually was pregnant. You know, I've experienced so much out of the norm and what you think you're going to with your pregnancies. And actually it probably is more the norm because everything stays so hushed-hushed that women don't talk about the losses because people tell us that we're being dramatic or, well, it's not like the baby was here. So I have heard absolutely everything you can imagine following the death of a child and a miscarriage, but especially a blighted ovum miscarriage. People act like because the embryo didn't form, that you're not supposed to mourn that loss, that you didn't actually lose something, but we do. We were pregnant, and we are mourning the loss of what we thought was going to be. From the moment we saw those pink lines, we loved that baby, and we wanted that baby. And then it was gone. And nobody ever talks about what you have to do after a miscarriage. You can't just start trying to get pregnant right away. You have to wait for your levels to go down to zero or so I was told and had to go every week for freaking blood work until I finally was like enough is enough but the doctors were just so cold I remember going in after my DNC for my follow-up and I sat on the table crying and the doctor walked in and he was like why are you crying and I looked at him and said I just lost my baby and he goes oh well this is so common Let's get those levels down to zero and you can try again. Just brushed off like nothing happened. Miscarriages are a real loss. Blighted ovum miscarriages are a real loss. We need to stop telling people how we expect them to grieve. And we need to learn 
just to be quiet and be supportive. In the 13 years since Cadence's passing, I have heard every comment under the sun. Well, you're still young. You could have more. You're better off. Did you really want to spend your life caring for a sick child? And just so many other ridiculous comments. Even now, people will say, it's been 13 years. Aren't you over it? And like I said before, yeah, I've adjusted. I'm over it. But that doesn't mean I have to stop talking about it. Stop talking about her. She was here and she changed my life. And I hope that I can use her story to help other parents. Going through all the experiences I've gone through has taught me that we need to be less defensive, less offended, and just love each other. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you may know nothing about. It costs nothing to be kind. Oh, sorry, this episode was a bit heavy, I know, but it's important to talk about the heavy issues. Again, thank you, Emily, so much for emailing me. If you would also like to reach out and share your stories or ask questions, I've already got a few questions rolling in. You can email me at livingrichardson at gmail.com. For more humor and relatable stories, follow me on TikTok and on my new YouTube channel, same name here, Living Richardson. I hope this episode helped you in some way. So go out there and spread the love. Thanks for listening.